When we called a strike in the third division, the following slogan was written on the canteen, death or freedom. O Lord, give the eternal blessed assumption to your servants and make them eternal memory to them. Among the inmates of the Kangir camp, there were priests of different faiths and denominations. Church services were held and the priests were Greek, Catholic and Orthodox, but the Mohammedans conducted their services. They had a mullah in the camp. We prayed for victory, for a better life. The Ukrainians prayed for Ukraine. <laughs> There was no violence, absolutely none. There was a brotherly and sisterly kind of love, but some of the inmates were in relationships even before the camp, and many of them united in the Kengir camp. These were different cases. I went to the girls to talk with them. I saw one girl on top of the bunk bed. She looked at me, smiled. That smile struck me, and I really liked it. This one girl with dark eyebrows. I did not have a relationship with anybody at the camp, but suddenly I fell in love and we started a relationship. And it just so happened that I got pregnant and he decided that we should marry. Dr. Kuyava held a mass and we were married. From the beginning of the uprising, all the camp's grocery stores were taken under rebel command. All kinds of groceries, flour, grain, and canned food. There was vodka and brandy, but nobody touched it. There was discipline. Food rations were given strictly in accordance with the camp regulations, and thefts by prison guards became a thing of the past. In our kitchen was the governing authority, and there was no such theft, and we began to eat better. We had to keep everything under control. It was my responsibility to make sure the kitchen, tailor shop, cobbler shop and bakery were operating smoothly. The stocks of goods were melting and the administration was not going to replenish our supplies. Once there was an alarm and we had to all gather in the camp square, we showed up for assembly and the head of the strike commission told us that we were nearly out of food. We were forbidden from taking food rations and from that point on we did not receive any more. He went on to say that we had some sugar and in a few days we would be issued a few grams of sugar per day. And every 10 days they reduced the rate of food. And we hung out our funeral flag on the tower, and the free workers saw it. We started to fly the kites that showed that we were facing starvation and we could die because of hunger. The free workers prepared trucks of goods and drove them to the gulag reception, but they were refused from entering the camp.
але їх не прийняли. The camp administration refused the food. The authorities surrounded the camp and consistently pressured the rebels mentally and psychologically with the use of loudspeakers. They demanded to stop the resistance. And they tried to lure the prisoners. Those who do not want to listen to this, a small group of saboteurs could come to us. There were cases that some people went to them because these prisoners nearly finished their sentences. But for the most part, we did not have such saboteurs. In the camp, there was a rebel department of propaganda, headed by Yuri Knopmus, a journalist, German by origin, born in St. Petersburg. About 700 leaflets were printed and distributed outside the camp. And then we invented the following thing. We flew kites together with leaflets. We directed them to the Kengir village, where free people lived. The kites were made by Japanese prisoners led by Yamala Choto. We requested them to let Moscow know what was happening here. We were putting in honest work and building their communism. How were they helping us? We wanted so that they would understand this. A Ukrainian from Zaporizhia region, Anatoly Kostritsky, the camp's most repeated craftsman, put together a kind of public announcement system to address the military who surrounded the camp. We articulated the fact to these soldiers that we are peaceful people. Then the generals ordered to cut off power to the prisoners. But Kostritsky came up with a solution. He used the car jump starter, attached a homemade turbine to it, and made an alternative source of power supply. They did not turn off the water. That's true. We made a water mill and rewound the motor. Ferenc Varkony recalled, my friend assembled a transmitter from parts of an X-ray machine and other medical equipment. Kostritsky did everything very well. It was almost ready to let it in the air. To the very last day of the Republic, Kostritsky kept improving his shortwave transmitter to make it more powerful. We were preparing to transmit abroad, and everything was made, the room and the watchtower. The transmitter was operated by Ferenc Varkany, who knew Morse code. He taught Yuri Knopmus and his young wife to work in the radio room. After the wedding, Ferenc told me that the message would be transmitted to the Vatican. The Vatican would know about our marriage. He worked in the radio room and I signaled SOS abroad, but nobody answered. The submissions were either jammed by the Soviet Secret Service or they didn't answer because they didn't want to ruin diplomatic ties with the Soviet Union. Another day of the Kangir uprising was coming to an end. For a month, the construction did not work. Nothing has been done. Negotiations were going on, they agreed, but nothing came true. After the hard lessons of life, after the arrests, exile, imprisonment, hard labor, they understood that to trust the heads of enforcement agencies meant not to respect yourself. We were waiting for the person from the Central Committee. We were waiting for him to come and say, let it be as you want. We felt it once. It was in the end of June, around the 20th of June. A lot of railway cars, 
The one, the second, made the noise as it hit the buffers. A buzzing tractor was operating and we didn't know what it was. And they gathered the forces, they smashed the exterior walls and made huge holes. So a decree came from the Supreme Soviet to free the youngsters, that's all, all the young people could leave the camp. They announced from the loudspeakers that all disabled people and mainly young people, guys and girls, you are free. I even talked to a girl and a guy, kids, there is a decree, go out to the camp, you are already free. But they did not want to leave, none of them left. They said, what will happen to you, will happen to us? I thought to myself, if I were them, I would go out. They renewed our spirits. After his shift in the radio room, Ferenc Varkony met with his young wife. Olga was waiting for me, he recalled. There was an amazing night around us. We held hands and were happy to be free together. That doesn't happen often in the life of prisoners. On June the 25th, at approximately 3 a.m. in the morning, it was still dark out. There were guns on watchtowers, not gun machines, but guns, not one, but two. And there were snipers, there were two, three or four. We almost did not sleep, and we heard an order through the loudspeaker, attention prisoners. Leave, otherwise we will shoot. Nobody left. It was the shot of the rocket, and it all began. On command, the snipers killed all the guards. A plane flew in and released rockets in order to create chaos. At first, they tried to storm the camp. The KGB officers, they came from here, from there, to shoot. A lot of guys were shot there. When they could not shoot anymore, they brought out the tanks. They brought the tanks, but it was forbidden, according to civil norms, to bring the tanks into the camp, where there were crowds of prisoners. The army was forbidden from entering. Every tank went to a different camp division. One went to the women's division and started to break the wall. A tank broke into the first barricade. Inside were old women and they started to scream and cry. And the tank entered the barrack. We all ran away. Those who ran away survived. Those who fell in front of the tanks died. When the tank went to the men's barrack, girls stood in front of the tanks. We thought that there would be normal people inside the tanks, young guys, but maybe they were drunk. We thought that tanks would not come in our direction, but they came. And then the girls from other barracks shouted towards us to run to the other side of the road, towards them. Some of us ran to them, while others didn't make it. Blood, sweat and cries. Susanna's legs were run over by the tank. I saw it, both legs, and she was still alive and threw the stone towards the tank. The guys went onto the tank. 
Over hands, breasts and everything else, it was scary. There was a hand lying there and a leg lying over there. The head of Gulag and his deputy, together with generals Dogich and Bichkov, stood on the balcony of the Steplog headquarters and controlled the operation. The people crowded near the barracks and he crumpled the people between the tank and the barracks. They began to shoot and we ran into the barracks and we laid down on the floor. They threw smoke bombs inside the barracks. We were forced to come out. We put wet towels on our faces and lay on the floor, but it did not help. When we wanted to throw the smoke bombs out of the barracks, they threw new ones inside. When somebody finally came out, they shot him immediately. You died inside or you died outside. There were guys who jumped out of the window in order to join the guys from the other barracks. But as soon as they went out, they fell down. There were some dead bodies near the barracks. The priest was passing by and said, what are you doing, cannibals? And they killed him. The men took stones and bricks from the wall, but what could you do with the bricks? When they saw the bricks, they were shot immediately. I grabbed at the bayonet, you understand, and near me a soldier struck a Belarusian guy twice with the bayonet, and his blood was on my hands, blood. Me and Kubievich were taken to the barracks, and there were no reasons to return, and we left there. And a guy opened his eyes, looked to me, and... Soroka found a white coat somewhere with a red cross and helped wounded people. Soroka helped them during this massacre. During the two hours, the guys from two barracks shot back. They had makeshift weapons, but what they could do with these weapons against tanks and against a regular army, what could they do? A lot of people were killed, and the priest, monk Victor, was also killed. The camp was burning, it was chaos, blood everywhere. Then I heard a tank pull up. The barrel of the gun broke the window, and the head of the camp came and said, go out. We came out and did not shoot. They surrounded us on two sides and made us march forward, hands on head and march forward. I saw a large pool of blood near our barracks. The whole time when it was covered with soil and sand, the blood was still seeping. Blood kept flowing. Even when everything was finished and the commission came from Moscow, I remember that they saw it. There was an order for soldiers to bury the bodies, but the place of this burial remains unknown to this day. There are various estimates of the number of people killed that day, and there are no exact numbers from the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Solzhenitsyn made first contact with journalists of Shezga's gun, Ken Gear, and published a book, 40 Days of Ken Gear, and he wrote in this book that 600 people were injured and killed. Approximately, there were 300 women and 500 men killed, but nobody knows the truth. 
They said that nearly 800 people died there. More men died than women. Activists of the uprising were arrested. 500 of them were sent to jail. Leaders were put on trial. According to the court verdict, the leaders of the uprising, including Kuznetsov, were sentenced to capital punishment, which was then replaced by 25 years imprisonment for Kuznetsov. It turned out that Captain Kuznetsov had been putting together dossiers for all the participants, for all the leaders of the uprising. And during the interrogation, when the leaders of the uprising were arrested, he wrote 43 pages of evidence. No one was spared. He wrote in detail what each of the rebels had done and how they could be incriminated. This stalwart communist as he had cast himself during the uprising, placed all the blame squarely on the Ukrainian nationalists. And six years later, he was released. 1,000 prisoners were transferred to other camps in Ozerlag, in the Magadan area. Prisoners were settled among locals in order to diffuse high-pitched emotions many prisoners felt. Ferenc Varkany recalled, the women who were locked up in railway carriages before us were told they would be immediately returned to the camp if they agreed to work. But the women refused. We'll go with the boys, they said. Like the 200 women who went out against the tanks, most of them were from Western Ukraine. Their determination and uncompromising resistance were heroic. The uprising in Jezgazgan was one of the brightest forms of confrontation between camp prisoners and the political system as a whole. It was not in vain they got their way, but only those who remained alive. That is the contribution of those victims and those people who supported the uprising. By the year 1956, Steplag had ceased to exist. The last leaders of the uprising, Gersh Keller and Yuri Knopmus, were shot in 1956, after Stalinism had already been condemned by the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the USSR. In that very year, 1956, three quarters of the political prisoners of Gulag were released. After release, Volodymyr Karatash will find Anna Ludkevich, the girl he had loved at first sight. They will create a family, raise children, and live a long life together. Alexander Kostritsky and Polina Pavlyuk got married in Kazakhstan and, after returning home, went on to live happily together till death parted them. From the condemned ward, Gersh Kala managed to send a note to his girlfriend, written in blood, as there was nothing else to write with. In it, he wrote he loved her, said goodbye, and revealed his real identity, Vasil Pendrak, born in the village of Ogarci, now Polish territory. Yuri Ferenchuk will become an artist renowned in the region of Bukovina. Then when I wanted to draw this picture, I was afraid I was... I was afraid that I would lose my mind. 
because I could not. I saw that blood. What should you say? Then I made small sketches. I tried, little by little, little by little, until I got used to those sketches. And then I started to draw this picture. And as you can see, it was Vizhnitsa. Nine months after the uprising, Olga will have a baby girl and name her Olenka. Shortly after the uprising, Ferenc Varkany will be deported to West Germany, where he will work as a journalist for Radio Liberty. He will publish a book from which the world for the first time will learn about the Kengir uprising. He will write letters to Olga, but they will never see each other again. Not far from Zheska's gun, at the former Kangir camp, local Ukrainian diaspora, together with American Ukrainians, erected a monument. Close by, there are similar monuments, established by Lithuania and the Russian Orthodox Church. Our memory cries to the stars, from the place that was once called Kangir, where freedom was put behind bars and rose up in revolt without fear, where my sisters lie buried in dry Kazakh land, beaten, tortured and branded with numbers, tulips bloom over them, bumblebees hum their songs, and the tank from the past never rumbles. Rest in peace, rebel heroes. May the land of Kangir be your final abode of freedom.